at least in, in my talk, uh, the same structure uh, and same pattern of hexagons and pentagons as appears on a soccer ball. And so this is, uh, and, and if you count the, the vertices here, you'll find the arrow 60. And this is part of a, a structure that was predicted long before it was ever um, ever observed in nature, but we see them now, we, we know how to fabricate these things, and there's, there's tremendous possibilities uh, for these types of structures, and I'll show you some pretty pictures of those things. And, um, and one possibility, before we put that sure. down, right, the, uh, the idea that maybe we can Put, put an atom inside. Put, put something a, put inside a, to deliver yeah. to you, and then have that open up. Large um, metal atom, for example. And <laughs> um, that's called an alibi, too. It's it's the type of, it, it turns out that carbon can take many forms. Diamonds, for example, the lead at the end of your pencil, graphite, buckyballs. So, very interesting stuff. Uh, and the other one I brought, and I have a slide that just shows this book. I just grabbed it on the way in. Uh, this is a, a book called No Small Matter science on the nanoscale, and it's a collaboration by a photographer who does uh, amazing things uh, in photography uh, and micro photography uh, of all types, and, and a, a, a scientist, George Whiteside at Harvard, uh, who annotates the photographs, and it's a wonderful uh, tour through nanotechnology uh, and, and the, the whole field. So, so I would recommend that as reading. I have another slide that shows a little bit more of a technical uh, introduction. So why don't I start? Real quick, are we going to have time at the end, do you think? Like we, we'll go we talk to them we'll have time. Half hour. Because then we can pass these around or you sure. guys can take a look at them. Um, all right. I think we should go for a half an hour. We've got another half hour. I think that you'll uh, lead us sure. with some discussions. I know that Wolf introduced our two sort of presenters today, but uh, this is John Marsh. He's a Associate Professor of Computer Science here at SUNY IT. And then uh, later on, Janet uh, Aliu is going to be coming up, and she is an Associate Professor, if you get this right, Nanobioscience at, at uh, CNSE, which is the College for Nanoscale, Nanoscale Science and Engineering. They're, they're one of our partners, as you heard uh, from Mike Pantry downstairs. So uh, you guys take it away. I'll keep you on the I'll keep you on task. And I am going to have to adjust these right, uh, because you want to be able to can you see that okay on camera? I can see it now, but we'll play it by ear. Leave it on. All right. Sounds good. You leave it on? Okay. Uh, okay, so I'm John Marsh. I'm in computer science, but I'm really a physicist that by training. That's what my PhD is in. And so I have a bit of a varied background that includes uh, not only some uh, self-assembly and uh, surface physics, this is what I study for my PhD uh, at Carnegie Mellon, but also uh, a good dose of microfabrication uh, in the world of integrated optics. So I've uh, also been in the fiber optic field and uh, working to uh, design and fabricate and test optical integrated circuits, which are pretty close to some of the technology that I'll show you here. Um, and so, as I say, uh, even though I'm in computer science these days and, and, and spend most of my time on cybersecurity, I do have some background uh, in this field. Uh, so here's an overview of, of the talk I'll, I'll give you, uh, sort of with an introduction, sort of asking the question, what is this uh, nanotechnology? What is this miracle of nanotechnology that you talk about? Uh, starting with uh, thinking small, how big is a nanometer, really? Uh, so I'll take you on a, a quick tour uh, down in, through the scale, uh, starting at a centimeter and going down to a nanometer. Nature's nano, we're, we're uh, we're immersed in nanoparticles all day long here on the, on the surface of the Earth. Uh, so to just give a, a bit of a, uh, an introduction to the fact that, that we, really are, uh, we really are living in a world of nanoparticles uh, all the time. Uh, microelectronics, computers and communications, this is a big one. This is where our technology reaches down through those length scales and finally is hitting these days that nano length scale. And this is mainly through microelectronics, which is now really reaching down into what is rightfully called nanoelectronics these days. And of course, we know, uh, you know, these slides on computers and communications, I hardly even have to present to, to you folks. Uh, everybody uh, is well aware of the revolution that has occurred and, and just how substantial uh, the changes in our lives that computers and communications and the internet smartphones have, have all uh, caused. Uh, then 
clean rooms in the Mariner toolbox. Uh, what is a clean room? And so this, this connects us to uh, the CNSC uh, in Albany and to the new facility we're building. And then very short introductions to MEMS and fullerenes and some everyday applications uh, and medical applications in Mariner. Okay, so here's uh, one of the, the, the book that I just held up. This is uh, recommended as a uh, general non-technical audience. Uh, here's another one that I, I would recommend as, as a more technical book. It's not at the scale, it's not a, a mathematical um, uh, textbook for engineers, but it's, it's much more technical. And by the way, these slides are all posted on my website. If you go to the SUNY IT's website, you'll be able to find your way, I think, pretty easily to my website. And, find these slides. Um, so what is this miracle of nanotechnology? This slide uh, is, is one that I probably don't understand any of the details on, but I have the general idea. This is some of the, the workings of our immune system. And this is showing you that at a molecular and cellular level, uh, there's a lot going on. This is uh, steps, these are steps in the workings of uh, T cells in our, in our uh, immune system, and it shows just, uh, at least pictorially, the complex interactions that are occurring at this scale, this molecular and atomic scale and the scale of uh, individual cells here. This is the nanoscale, and it, and it shows just how complicated these things are. This is just one process that occurs in our bodies amongst millions of processes like this, and they're all occurring at this nanoscale. Here's uh, a, a type of virus that attacks bacteria, uh, called a bacteriophage, uh, and you can see that it has uh, tremendous structure. You can see moving parts. You can see the, that uh, this, this is really a sophisticated nanomachine that, that exists. Um, this is an E. coli bacteria. The uh, long, pressing the right button, the long dimension here is about two micrometers. Uh, the short dimension is about a micrometer. But these, these uh, little uh, fibrils are on the order of 20 nanometers in, in diameter. And so we're here at another example of a living creature uh, that is really, in some sense, a, a big nano machine. Okay, so there's this miracle of nanotechnology. And is it really a miracle? Well, yeah, it sure, sure seems like it. This is, uh, you know, the Living things can be thought of as gigantic nano machines that are existing, that again, with millions of these microscopic scale and nanoscopic scale processes all working in concert to, to, to keep us alive and make us exist. Um, so, how big is a nano? Well, it's a one billionth of a meter. Let's start. Uh, up at a centimeter and take steps down in factors of 10. Okay, and so at each step down, we're going to 10 times as small, or 10 times smaller. So starting at a centimeter, about the size of your pinky, down to a millimeter, uh, the size of the lead in your pencil, say. And then from a millimeter, what I'll do is I'll take three steps down to one millionth of a meter, 10 to the minus six meters, and this is what's called a micrometer or what I would call a micron, and I'll probably call it a micron for the rest of the, the talk here. But this is one, uh, or this is three steps down from the millimeter. Okay, and so a micron is to a millimeter what a millimeter is to a meter. So we have a meter here, more or less a yard, and we have a millimeter, the pencil lead. Now go from your pencil lead down to the micrometer, or a micron. Now we're gonna go three more steps down, and that's gonna take us down to the nanometer. Okay, so it's uh, uh, 10 to the minus 9 meters, or uh, 1 millionth of a millimeter, okay? And it's when we hit this nanometer scale that we're really down to the scale of that <coughs> molecules. Okay, and anything in the range from about 1 tenth of a micron, or 100 nanometers, or 0.1 micrometer, uh, from about 100 nanometers on down is considered the nano realm. Uh, for the purposes of, of nanotechnology. And off to the side are lots of pictures. I'll show you some pictures, though, uh, that show, sort of show you the same things here in the next few slides. But there are pictures of uh, representative at each of these scales. 
Uh, okay, so starting at the millimeter, we have the, the head of a pin. Uh, it turns out you can buy on the internet the carved and painted chicken, which is <laughs> about a millimeter big. Um, and, and stepping down from there, half of a millimeter to your pencil lead is a mechanical pencil. Uh, a human hair is one tenth of a millimeter or 100 microns. Okay. Um, the pixel size on an iPhone 4 is 75 microns, even, even thinner than the human hair. And um, uh, about as small of a thing as, as you can discern with your with the naked eye, and that's why they call it a retin retinal uh, uh, display. Uh, down to 10 microns now. Uh, pollen spores, there's all kinds of variety of these things here, and I do know that it's uh, allergy season. I don't know if anyone else notices that, but I can, my, uh, my head can detect these things. Um, down to one micron. This is a bacteria called MRSA. This is a very deadly um, uh, resistant type of bacteria that kills literally tens of thousands of people per year in the United States. Uh, this one shows the electromagnetic spectrum. Again, a scale of sizes here. But this is showing us down at the micrometer or the micron scale. Here's one micron, and this is showing that visible light has a wavelength of about half of a micron, okay? And when we go three steps down from the micron to the 10 to the minus three micron, now we're down at the nano scale. So uh, this puts the wavelength of light longer uh, wavelengths, we have radio and microwaves, shorter wavelengths, we have gamma rays and X rays. Um, down to the submicron scale, this is at one tenth of a micron uh, or 100 nanometers. This is a, a representation of some sort of an AIDS virus, a photograph of any sort. Um, but down at the 100 nanometer scale, uh, and finally, all the way down to the nanometer scale where we've got individual atoms. Uh, this is showing a lattice of uh, two types of atoms. It's some sort of a crystal matrix. It's a crystal of salt or something like that. So that's sort of a very quick trip down the size, down the steps of the scale to the nanometer scale where we're really at the atomic and molecular scale. Um, nanoparticles in our environment. We are surrounded by nanoparticles. Um, here on the Earth, clouds are, are formed uh, out of uh, water droplets on, on the order of a few hundred, a couple hundred microns in size, but they're nucleated by truly nanoparticles, uh, which are submicron in size, down in that nano realm. Each cloud particle, each cloud droplet is nucleated or started by a nanoparticle. They're all over them. Um, aerosols in general are suspensions of either liquids or solids in the air, literally floating in the air. And uh, everything from, um, from uh, smokes, smoke to pollution, uh, these uh, many types of pollution are, are very harmful to humans and, and many people have problems with asthma or lung diseases that are a result of aerosols and literally a result of nanoscop uh, nanoscopic scale particles uh, in the atmosphere and, and in, in what we breathe. Uh, here's a picture of the smog. So a lot of the smog uh, uh, is nanoparticles of all different sorts uh, that we breathe in. If you go down to 100 microns in size, uh, the particles you breathe in can get into the very smallest uh, areas of your lungs. If you go down to the nanoscale, 100 nanometers, uh, or tens of nanometers, these inhaled particles can actually get to the actual uh, interface where oxygen and carbon dioxide, dioxide are being exchanged in your blood, and they can actually get into your bloodstream. Uh, and small enough nanoparticles have been shown to, to be able to, to, to go through cell membranes. Uh, and so there is a lot of concern about nanoparticles, but most of these concerns have been around for a long time. We know it well as pollution. Uh, other natural sources uh, include uh, volcanoes, uh, fires, uh, and, and all sorts of things like that. So, so we're, we're surrounded by nanoparticles you know, on the earth. Um, plants. Right here, uh, soot. Is, uh, you, you light a candle in the house and you're, you're putting out billions and billions of nanoparticles in, into the atmosphere. Um, just to keep moving here, um, 
microelectronics, computers, and communications. And let me give you just a, a quick overview of the processes and uh, uh, tools that are used to create microchips for computers. Um, starting with the vacuum tube, I think we had a little introduction to this with uh, President uh, Ye's comments and Mike Fancher's comments. Starting with the vacuum tube, moving to the transistor, circuit boards populated by many transistors uh, and uh, circuit elements. Uh, but we've replaced those, and we've replaced those with computer chips. Starting with raw silicon. Silicon <coughs> is an element, it looks in its raw form like a shiny, glassy rock, a metallic glass almost. And it has a, a, a molecular structure, or a crystalline structure of the same as, as a diamond, uh, very similar to carbon. Uh, and we can grow pure silicon crystals of various sizes. Uh, the, the, the largest ones these days are 300 millimeters in diameter, the size of a dinner plate. Okay, and that's what they're talking about in CNSE down in Albany. They can handle 300 millimeter wafers. Well, these are same crystal, crystals of silicon grown from a melt, pulled up very slowly from molten silicon, uh, hardening as and crystallizing as they're pulled into a cooler atmosphere. And then what we do is we, we dice them up with a saw and create these wafers. And this is how, this is what we start with to uh, create computer chips. And here's the picture that, that uh, I think Mike Fancher was talking about, maybe showing. This is that first integrated circuit. This has two or three or four, I don't know how many, uh, transistors on the surface of this silicon wafer. And the, the basic processing that's used to create these is, is uh, photolithography. What you do is you put what's called a photoresist. You can put a droplet of this stuff and spin your wafer and spread it out on the wafer. But then this photoresist has a great property in that the parts of it that you hit with light are going to behave differently when you wash them off with, say, alcohol. You can leave, either two types of photoresist, you can either leave the photoresist or not leave the photoresist where the light hit. And so if you hit this surface now with a pattern of light, you can then create a pattern of photoresist, and you can use that as a starting point to make all types of patterns. You can etch away at the surface, or you can deposit new things on top of that surface. You can deposit new things on top and then diffuse them in at very high temperatures. There's an amazing array of things you can do now to that surface based on this first initial step of photolithography. And here's another picture of that. You have some sort of a pattern here that you shine light through, and it's focused down onto the, onto the wafer. And then you can see here that the single mass pattern makes only one chip, and you have to move that across the wafer to make multiple chips. Uh, after we expose multiple chips and run through a lot of processing steps, we have a computer chip. Here's a wafer with a lot of computer chips. Then we cut them all up. This is a dicing saw. We cut them up and we have individual computer chips. And this is an example of one. This is a, a fairly modern chip. Uh, you can see there's an awful lot going on here. Uh, many hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of transistors on, on modern chips these days. Here's one that's in a package uh, where uh, each connector is, is there's a tiny little thinner than a human hair, gold wires connecting from each of these connectors onto the surface of the chip on the inside of this package. Um, Here's a Pentium chip. Uh, I think this is maybe a 486 chip, an Intel chip. This is a Pentium chip, just a couple of different pretty pictures of some, some modern computer chips. And as they said earlier in the session, we can get billions of transistors on, on each chip these days. Uh, this shows uh, a representation of Moore's law. As the years go by, the number of transistors on a chip, you can see we're up here into the billions now. The number of transistors on a chip, it looks like a linear increase, but these are jumping in factors of tens. This is an exponential scale, or a logarithmic scale here, and you can see then we have an exponential growth in the number of transistors on each chip. Uh, this shows a corresponding diagram where in order to fit more transistors on the chip, then each one has to get smaller. And so this is showing the feature size that we can create on the chips as a function of the same period of time from roughly the 70, 1970 to the present. 
And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the feature size in nanometers get down to this nano scale here by about 13,000. So we really are controlling things. We're controlling our manufacturing processes down to this nano scale, and we're down to feature sizes of 30 or 40 nanometers these days. And this is a big part of what's going on in Albany in the research into uh, uh, chip manufacturing and why they have this clean one. Uh, here's uh, the motherboard. I'm going to go very quickly through the next few slides because, as I say, I think you all know the story. Once we have these fast computer chips, we can build computers, we can uh, build smartphones, we, can, we have the internet. Uh, so here's a, a motherboard for a computer. You can see lots of chips on it. Um, here's another one. You can see just the socket for the chip here. This is where that uh, the chip I showed previously would fit in. Okay, so this is the motherboard of the computer. Um, this is a flash drive. Here's the chip on the several. There's a bunch of chips on the inside here, uh, but everything we use these days in electronics is based on computer chips. Uh, modern personal computers, uh, smartphones, and tablets. Uh, and the next few slides show it. Does anybody recognize these guys? This is Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who started Google in their early 20s. This is their first server, built with Legos. Well, <laughs> built with some Legos on top of it anyway. This is their first Google server set up. There's the machine with the Legos on top. This is what started Google, right here in Stanford. Um, and today, of course, uh, you know, the rest is sort of history uh, from, that, from that beginning. We have these gigantic buildings full of computers. These are great big giant data centers. Look at all the air conditioners on top of there. Uh, here's another view of a, a Google data center. Again, just uh, massive air conditioning units. Uh, from the inside, uh, they are floor to ceiling with fantastic amounts of, of equi computing equipment that, that literally runs today's internet. Okay, here's, here's an example of some Cisco equipment used for routing. Uh, so some of this equipment in here is it's a combination of servers and uh, networking equipment. Uh, some of the networking equipment is shown here. This is what gives us our ultra high speeds in the backbone of the internet. Uh, and so, you know, we really are living in this world today of, of interconnectedness uh, enabled by these, um, by microchips, by computer chips both on the computing side and on the networking and communication side. So that's a big part of the story of nanotechnology because we've shown how uh, as we start with microfabrication uh, in computer chips, now we're, all the, we're reaching all the way down into that nano scale and, and we, we have control at that nano stop it. Uh, okay, so clean rooms in the nano toolbox. These are a few slides on just what types of tools are used for microchip fabrication and what types of things uh, are in clean rooms, are in the clean room at CNSE in Albany, are likely to be in the clean room here uh, on the SUNY IP campus. Uh, this is a picture of the clean room at uh, CNSE. It's a very big clean room. Uh, you can see here all of these little uh, things, well, they're not so small, they're about the size uh, of a small suitcase probably. These are wafer holders that uh, are used for processing these 300 millimeter wafers. There's a whole stack of wafers in there and they are made specially so the robotic arms can reach in, open them up and pull out one wafer at a time and work with them. And so you can literally just stack these things uh, at the input of one of these machines uh, and then stack some more at the output and they will process these wafers for you. You don't have to, human hands don't have to touch these things. And so there's all types of processing steps that uh, these wafers undergo in the manufacturing process. And, and these are many examples of that. Uh, so this is more of a research grade uh, setup. This is an example of uh, two examples of what are called mask lamps. So when you put that pattern uh, over top the wafer and shine the light through, you need to be able to line that, that mask or that pattern up with the wafer underneath. And you can see uh, here that uh, there's where you can put your wafer, here's where you put your uh, your mask and you shine the light through it. 
these are sort of research grade, small scale, where you can do this uh, on a one-off basis to make some experimental devices. Uh, this is uh, an electron microscope. I think this is the very first one, but this is a modern one. Electron microscopes are amazing. Uh, they work, instead of viewing things with photons or with visible light, they view things with electrons, which behave as a wave. And so you, you literally focus uh, beams of electrons and you can take pictures that way. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the pictures from the electron microscope. Here's some red blood cells. Here's the head of an ant. Amazing photographs that you just can't get with visible light. Uh, and so this is a very important tool in the clean room, especially in a research grade clean room where you need to see what you've made and you need to be able to look at that nano scale. Um, Here's a picture, an electron microscope picture of uh, the surface of a, of a computer chip, for example, showing you that there really are a lot of steps in the processing and the patterning of what's going into making that computer chip work. Here's um, a, a tunneling microscope, a scanning tunneling microscope, or an atomic force microscope. Uh, this is another way of looking and viewing things on that nano scale that, that uh, is a very important tool in the toolbox these days uh, for nanoscale science. And these emerged only in uh, the early 1980s. And they gave us our first pictures of actual individual atoms. And the way they do this, this is the tip of a scanning probe variety of these uh, instruments. Uh, you have this sharp tip, and it's literally atomically sharp. And what you do is you want to look at a surface, and what you're going to do is you're going to put that tip on a camera and you're going to literally drag it across the surface. And as it gets dra dragged across the surface, it's going to go up and down over individual atoms, and you can build a picture of that way. Uh, this is a picture of some commercially available tips for the atomic force microscope. Again, they have this atomically sharp tip there. And these are springs, cantilever springs. And so the way the thing works is you have that tip on the spring, you have your sample, and you literally drag it across the surface of the sample. And, to, and you, you, you'll then, this cantilever, the spring will go up and down, and you can watch its motions by bouncing a laser beam on it. And as it bounces up and down, this laser beam moves even further. And you can actually see it. And you can create pictures as well. One of the very first things they did back, uh, uh, okay, in 1990, uh, after they, they get gotten these things working, they found that they could not only view atoms, but they could drag them around on the surface. And this is a picture, maybe some of you have seen this before, very famous. Uh, the guys at IBM drug a bunch of atoms around on the surface. I think this was on the surface. Maybe iron atoms on the surface of copper, I forget uh, what it was. But they literally could push them around spell the, the letters IBM with individual atoms. Truly amazing technology. So these atomic force microscopes and uh, tunneling microscopes are very important in uh, the toolbox for nanotechnology. This is a picture of a silicon surface, uh, and this is several hundred microns across here. Uh, if we zoom in on that silicon surface, uh, I'm sorry, several hundred nanometers across here. If we zoom in on that silicon surface, uh, down to the nanometer scale, you can literally see individual atoms. And this shows that these, uh, that this is really an individual, a single crystal of silicon. Uh, uh, over many, many, many atomic distances, we have good atomic ordering. Uh, this is another one. This is the surface of a gallium arsenide chip with some, uh, some impurities uh, adsorbed into it at high temperature. Gallium arsenide is another material system will be used to make computer chips. In fact, in your cell phone, you'll have gallium arsenide chips because they can operate faster than silicon chips. They're more expensive, but they can go very fast and re-enable our, our cell phones. Here's some more, uh, I guess this is iron atoms on copper. Uh, you can drag them around and make that. You can see individual atoms. Here's a platinum surface. You can see the, the crystalline structure. Uh, and this is a slide I like because it, it allows me to connect another very important area of nanotechnology um, to, to uh, 
uh, to, to connect two of very important areas of nanotechnology. So we talked about the, uh, the scanning microscopes that allow us to see these individual atoms, but a very important part, uh, the part of the technology that goes hand in hand in, with that, and which is enabled, by the way, by the supercomputers that we've made, is simulations. And so not only can we view these nanoscale phenomena, here we have organic molecules on a copper surface. So we've got some sort of soft, condensed matter, maybe a polymer, on top of a copper surface, and we can see them, but we can also simulate them. You can see that this is a simulation where we have literally thousands of atoms in the simulation, and we start from fundamental principles of chemistry and physics to allow these atoms to interact, and we see how these organic molecules are going to settle down on that surface for example. And so you can see here that they've got the view of the actual thing and simulations which show a very similar uh, arrangement. You can see different types of arrangements here, a dimer, and you can see the dimers in your actual microscope, uh, tunneling microscope pictures. You can see trimers. Simulations show this type of pattern, and here they are. It's amazing. So, very important to nanotechnology these days is the ability to run these large-scale simulations with supercomputers to, um, to, to verify the things that we're seeing. Uh, this is a, a picture of uh, an atomic force microscope picture of uh, hard disk surface. You can see individual bits of it. Um, I mean, this is a, an atomic force microscope and a magnetic force microscope. There's all types of variations on these. Uh, atomic force and scanning tunneling microscopes that I've just been talking about. Um, so there's a hard disk surface. Here's some, some other equipment that's that's used, and this is these would be some of the sorts of things you saw in that clean room. E beam lithography used for pattern for drawing patterns uh, onto surfaces and for making uh, masks. PCD deposition, you can deposit very carefully controlled. Uh, mixtures of chemicals onto the surface of these wafers and uh, for further processing. A sputter is used, it's, it's like kind of an old one, but it's used for depositing uh, metal onto chip surfaces. And a focused ion beam is used for what's called ion milling. You can literally go in there and dig trenches in the silicon wafers with this. So there's a whole bunch of tools that, that are used, and, and these are typically million dollar or multi-million dollar machines that are used in this process. I mean, these are the types of high-tech tools that are used to create microchips. Um, and now I've got a couple of sections here at the end where I'm just going to give you a flavor. I'm not going to go into much detail at all. Uh, one is MEMS. Uh, so we have all of this technology for making microchips, and some of the guys who made microchips got creative and decided, you know what, we're going to we're going to have fun here. We're going to make some patterns that aren't just patterns of circuits on the chip. We're going to make patterns, and we're going to use ion milling, and we're going to make some mechanical things. And they can make these things sets of gears and uh, springs and gears that <coughs> actually work. These things really do work. These are made by a guy named Eric Drexler. Very famous photos here. You can Google the word MEMS, and you'll see these same photos. But the possibilities are are pretty limitless here when you start thinking about using this technology and creating actual 3D structures at these microscopic layers. These are probably, this is uh, several hundred micrometers across. Okay, so these are nanoscale, but they're certainly um, microscale. Okay, several hundred micrometers across. Here's another example. Uh, I think this is uh, vibrating here. This is, this is some sort of a spring, and this thing vibrates. Uh, here's a, a dust mite of uh, hundreds of microns across uh, relative to some of these MEMS or these uh, MEMS uh, devices. Uh, this is a picture, an out of focus picture, of another type of MEMS, which has certainly been uh, well uh, commercialized these days. These are, this is an array of micrometers. And you can control smears individually uh, uh, with the electronics and you can tilt them and we use these 
uh, in all of our projectors these days. Projectors used to be much bigger and much heavier than they are today. Now you can buy very small, lightweight. They all had these uh, types of MEMS chips in them. An early one is, is the DLP chip from Texas Instruments. This has a, over a million mirrors on it. Uh, and these DLP chips are, are used in all of these projectors these days. So they are all have this technology in them. This is, the, I think, the tip of a needle a 100 micron scale where you can see all of these mirrors. And basically, you shine light at those mirrors, and it's used to make the projection. Okay, so one pixel corresponds to one MEMS mirror on that surface. Okay, so MEMS is, is something clearly you can see from those pictures it offers tremendous, uh, tremendous opportunities in the future. Full rings are another. Now we really are at this manner of scale. Full rings include this um, buckyball, and these, there's the picture of the buckyball, 60 carbon atoms. Well, not only can you make this sort of a soccer ball thing, you can make balls of different sizes, you can make tubes, you can make flat sheets. This is called graphene, and uh, there's been a tremendous amount of uh, work in graphene in just the last three to five years. Um, and these uh, structures have fantastic properties. When you get down to the nanoscale, uh, things behave differently. Uh, you have much more surface area to volume uh, ratio than you have at macroscopic scales. Uh, not only are the mechanical properties different, but the electrical properties and the thermal properties, everything changes when you get down to these sizes. And we can do amazing things with these, uh, including uh, making wires out of them, we can track individual atoms of various sorts inside of these structures uh, and literally build a little, a little holder for an atom, okay? Um, and so, here's just a couple more pictures of, of the graphene sheets folding around into a, a nanotube. Uh, and, and so, there's tremendous possibilities there. I'm, I, I could speak for a whole hour on those things. Um, so, Fullerines are named after Buckminster Fuller, who, who made the geodesic domes that, that resemble these. Um, another area of everyday and medical applications, this shows uh, some, some molecules on a water surface. Uh, half the molecule likes the water, half of it doesn't. They tend to line up on the surface like this. This is how soap works. Half of it is uh, in the water and half of it uh, is in the oil. But you can Pull, you can put these on the surface of water and you can pull a glass plate out and you are literally self-assembling uh, these molecules on the surface of that plate. And so self-assembly is a tremendous, uh, powerful way of controlling or at least having some control over the way we're arranging individual and groups of molecules on the surface. And this, this type of self-assembly is, is a great example uh, in the field of wettability, where I did my PhD research, this is showing a surface where the water wets it completely. Um, and this is showing successively de-wetting surfaces, where here we have completely non-wetting surface. The, 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 beads, the water beads up on the surface. And what you're seeing here then is a macroscopic effect. This water droplet is big. It's millimeters in size. But you're seeing a macroscopic effect of a single layer of molecules at that surface. Okay, it's essentially a single layer of Teflon molecules at the surface. And the applications of this have been around for many years, but the field is still very rich. This is uh, an application in fabrics. So you, you know of your Scotch Guard, your fabrics that, that won't be wet by a spill. Um, written oh, five minutes, okay. Uh, we can also put these layers on um, the, the windshield of your car. And so, uh, commonly known as Rain-X, uh, when I was a PhD student, we were working on a product called Aquapel that I guess is a precursor to Rain-X, and, and uh, we helped them in testing this stuff. Uh, but you can see uh, the tremendous uh, enhancement of visibility here over the untreated surface uh, when it's raining in there. Medical applications. Uh, there is uh, an even wider world of medical applications that I'm not probably qualified to talk about, but uh, just to give you a flavor, uh, everything from engineering, nano, 
engineering services for biocompatibility for implants or MEMS machines or uh, other uh, nano devices for drug delivery uh, to imaging, advanced imaging techniques. The, the possibilities in the medical world are truly fascinating and uh, there is a tremendous amount of research going on there. This is uh, just some pretty pictures uh, to get the idea. Uh, there's hope that even someday we'll find cures for cancer using these types of technologies and applying them to the medical field. Uh, this is another picture showing some of the amazing types of imaging we have these days. And throughout this, all the way through the technology used to create images like this, everything from the computers that run it to uh, the, the devices used for the imaging itself, uh, nanotechnology is playing a role here. Uh, we even have nano-engineered surfaces uh, which are antibacterial. For example, you can buy computer mice which have antibacterial surface. You can buy uh, baby toys and, and, and uh, things like that which have antibacterial surfaces. Kitchen, part of your kitchen may have antibacterial surfaces due to nanotechnology. Uh, the future, there's been a lot of science fiction written about uh, nanotechnology, and some of it's kind of wild. A lot of it has to do with nano robots, uh, maybe taking over the earth or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but this is obviously a fanciful picture of a nano robot maybe helping out your immune system by grabbing a bad guy. Uh, another one is uh, obviously very fanciful. This is science fiction. Uh, some sort of a nano robot treating an individual red blood cell. Uh, but this is. Uh, these are, you know, people are seriously thinking about this kind of thing, and we're driving the science forward, and, and so who knows what the future holds uh, for nanotechnology. Um, I'll stop there. Well, why don't you take some questions while Jim, do you want to switch your computer over?
they tend to be non-typical jobs that you would think of. And also, the jobs are changing all the time because the, the technology is moving forward so fast. So it is going to be about STEM, but it's going to be about how do you, uh, how really do you teach STEM? And it's not just the science and the technology and the engineering and the mathematics, but it's really understanding the whole life cycle of what is going on here. And if you can understand the life cycle of the technology, then you understand what level you can fit into, what level you're excited about, what level you're passionate about. And the other point that, uh, that I'll try and get across to you is we really need to teach students uh, to be entrepreneurs at a very early age. Uh, rather than just teaching them, here's the technology, here's how you use it, here's the technology, here's how you use it, but what could we do to improve on it? Also, what are the grand challenges of society? Uh, at, it used to be that uh, universities handled problems separately, and then uh, faculty at universities really started collaborating. Now you have statewide efforts, you have national efforts, international efforts. No longer do we live really uh, in our own environment where we just focus on our immediate problems. So almost everything we do, uh, train through our education, is to think about the world globally and to think about global problems. And I think we have to introduce kids to that at an earlier age. Now, before I, I go into this and before I talk about the quotes, I was inspired very much by um, an after school activity that I was involved in. And I was supposed to go talk to students that were K through 12. And it actually ended up being K through 3. All right. And what I was impressed by is there was one student, I was talking about mitosis, chromosomes assembling on a structure in cells. It's called the mitotic spindle. This is something that you see when cells divide, and you have to divide our chromosomes, our duplicated chromosomes, into two daughter cells. There was a student there who was five years old, and his parents had gotten him one of these cheap little microscopes, and they bought him little slides. And he knew all about mitosis, and he knew all about chromosomes, and he knew all about microtubules. He's a very young kid. And so what it tells me is often maybe we will be the ones that are holding our kids back. We have to educate ourselves so we can help to uh, guide our children in the right directions. And uh, we shouldn't feel that we have to wait until they're just graduating from high school to be able to handle this technology. Certainly they can handle the devices we give them at a much earlier age. So I would like to see us really uh, push this education to a much younger age. We're almost pay playing a little bit of catch up right now. And, uh, but we, we really need to get beyond the catch up and really start dressing as, dressing as well the younger, um, the younger level of that game as well. So two great quotes. Uh, nanotechnology is going to change America on a scale equal to or not uh, greater than the computer revolution. And the point about this quote is honestly the uh, nanotechnology is one of the keys to ensure that our nation uh, continues to be an economic powerhouse. But it's really going to affect the fabric of our lives. It's really going to affect us in, in ways that we can't imagine. We can't ignore nanotechnology. It's not a flash in the pan. It's here and it, you know, if we just ignore it for a while, it will go away and something else will come along that, that maybe we feel like we can understand better. As you listen to talks on nanotechnology in the field, hopefully you feel kind of comfortable with it. You're starting to get a little bit more comfortable. It used to be when we would show iconic DNA symbols. Everybody was like, oh, DNA. And now everybody's like, oh, DNA, genome sequencing. Yes, we're, we're comfortable. So you will get comfortable with nanotechnology. You just need to hear it all the time. You just need to, to educate yourself all the time about it. Um, the biggest breakthroughs in nanotechnology are going to be new materials that are developed. Now, when I think about new materials, I think about polymers. So one of the classes that I teach over at CNSE is a class to nanoengineering students on polymers. And when we think about polymers, we have polymers all over the place. We have it here, we have it in the materials here, uh, we have it in devices here in the plastic water bottles. So polymer, a poly chain of some type of chemical compound. The DNA in our cells is a natural biopolymer. So polymers were a great discovery. And in fact, uh, you know, what would women do without nylons? What would we do without some of the materials um, that were made with polymers that, that started to really uh, worked their way into the market uh, around 1937 to 1939. That's when, when nylon was developed by DuPont. So when we think about new materials, we're talking about new materials not only in polymers, different types of polymers, but really this merger between biology and man-made devices. And that's the beauty of it. Uh, we will move, we, we study biology separately, we, we kind of 
trying to study polymer materials separately. Merging these materials is really one of the next generation, and that will create not only new materials, new applications. We're also taking traditional materials like DNA and using them uh, in other means. So let me just reiterate one of the points that Michael Fancher made. And that was that at CMSE, what we, were, what we are looking to do is to really combine discovery and innovation with this commitment to education, skills, training, and outreach. What we realize is that we are going on at this full force pace. And if we don't have really everyone coming along with us, the parents, the educators, uh, the young students uh, that are getting into this field, if we don't bring everybody along, then this really could crash, right? Because you need that infrastructure to support it. So we are very aware of that, and it's one of the beautiful uh, components of CNSE is that we do have industry on site, that we do have education on site, that we have these partnerships, and it's what uh, Dr. Lane Calieras likes to call a shared burden of responsibility. And it's that realization that if we don't invest in this type of infrastructure, we don't invest in these partnerships, then really we're going to fall behind because companies will not have the personnel that they need to really be able to uh, carry forward with, with the technology as it advances. And in this image, it just shows there are some images on the right. You see the cereal box here as one point. But these are different activities that I'll talk about, uh, ways that you can engage either at your school or as a parent, activities that you can get involved in uh, with your students. And then this is, these are carbon nanotubes. You saw the MEMS device. This is a wafer. Beautiful introduction by John, because now I don't have to tell you what all these, these items are. This is DNA of origami, and I'll talk about that. <laughs> all right, so here I am. I'm part of a great team of nanobioscience uh, experts, really, at CMSE. We have a background which is both a strong background in biology and a strong background in STEM, basically engineering and math. So if we can't cross across, if we can't talk across disciplines to the engineers and the mathematicians, and they, as engineers, mathematicians, physicists, material scientists, can't talk with us, then the fields won't move forward. So this is a beautiful team that has the expertise on the biology end, but also the expertise on the engineering end to really start to, to move these two technologies. So when you think about CMSE, these are all the points that I'd like to cover today. And you see it's, it's a variety of points. I want to start out with, I started out with a little bit about what our educational strategy is, and that is really to uh, mix manufacturing and education. And I'll show you how this is a reiterative process. And that's a little tricky. I was at a Project Lead the Way conference in DC on a panel for analyzing K through 12. And it's a tricky process because we're used to sort of sticking in the curriculum and letting that work for us for several years. Well, that may not work quite so well. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that we have to uh, revamp the system dramatically every year, but it means we need to have these modules that we can move in that are teaching modules, and that's where the universities can help. The universities can pro provide teaching modules that help to give some of the background on, on nanotechnology. Uh, you need to understand what the whoops, sorry, you need to understand what the careers in nanotechnology are. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that. We'll discuss some high school education programs, summer camps for at-risk youth, uh, regional collaborations in nano education, uh, and, and these are very exciting and ongoing all the time. Uh, how do we educate educators and administrators? How do we educate parents and the public? How do we reach that younger K through 12? How do we not wait? until there are some great programs really being set up in high schools where students start to uh, actually work in labs in their junior and senior years. So they're getting really involved in the research at an earlier age. I'd like to get them up even earlier. I'd like to promote a little bit of what we're doing at undergraduate research uh, at CMSE just to show you that we are being successful in our, in our strategies. And then types of instructional partnerships that can be set up and then these multi-level commitments and, and thinking constantly about these multi-level commitments. So we really need to be working together as, as a team in all New York State, and we are doing that. All right, so CNSE, Nano starts here. This is what we would typically view up here as what we call silos. And that means you might have a program that is just geared 
to one age group. It might be just, these are K through 12 programs. These are our undergraduate programs. These are our graduate. These are our certificate programs. And what these arrows mean is that you need to bridge traditional silos. Just as if you would put, let's say you put biology up here, let's say you put fine arts here, let's say you put engineering here, you need to bridge these silos. So everybody needs to be in communication with each other. And it's interesting because, again, with this polymers class, I started out at the beginning of the class with a number of engineering students, and I asked them, are any of you interested in biology? No, nah, we're not interested in biology. That was for somebody else. By the end of the course, everybody wants to get involved in biology because they didn't realize, oh, biology, bottom-up manufacturing. We're going to be making uh, maybe these, these self-assembling uh, robotic systems. How do you get the artificial intelligence? How do you get to uh, prosthetics that integrate well with the human body? Uh, really, you combine engineering and biology, and they just haven't really realized it. And so they're starting to realize that. The second part of this, it's really this bottom part, which shows that it's a reiterative process. It has to be a reiterative process. So what that means is we have basically our partner-based experimental learning. We have a workforce, a workforce that needs trained workers. Uh, the amount of money that they lose uh, to have somebody come on site and for them to have to retrain them, uh, they really need a trained workforce. Now, you don't have to be trained in precisely what they do, but if you have a, a certain background that they need, and I'm going to show tell you some of what those components are, then it's perfect. Then you're easier, it's easier for you to integrate into this workforce. Outreach, awareness, recruitment. Uh, we have to recruit students. Uh, nano, we want to make nano cool. Uh, but nano, using nano is a lot cooler right now than developing nano. So we have to really change that. We have to uh, change how students think about it. And I think the idea is, again, to talk to them about entrepreneurship, to talk to them about, well, why don't you invent this? Why don't you discover this? Why don't you be the driver in the field? To let them know that they can be uh, at, that, at that level. And then a skill set analysis. Uh, I'm going to show you a skill set analysis that was done for the semiconductor industry for wafer fabrication. So you'll get an idea of those types of jobs. And this was uh, really a skill set analysis that was developed by a number of the key players in the semiconductor industry. And it was a not only a business effort, but it was supported by the National Science Foundation. So it was supported by uh, the federal agencies that support educating the next generation scientists. How we develop our curriculum and how that will change, how we develop teachers and teacher development workshops. There are also great programs across the state where teachers can actually go and they can build uh, their own chip on, on waiver. So they can go through the process without even just seeing slides on the process because you need both hands-on and uh, more of a didactic approach. So, how has CMSE impacted uh, the local community? Well, more, more local but some regional. We started out in 2009, I think when we really uh, had a lot of the statistics uh, really um, available to us. It's important to track the progress, right? And we realize that. We realize that we do these events and we want to know, are we having an impact? Are those students entering careers in nanotechnology? And it's important to track. So we uh, hosted about 3,812 students uh, at the University of Albany Complex, but also through outreach programs that was about 7,000. Now we've had about 50,000 individuals come through and about 10,000 of those K through 12. So we are getting the word out, and that is nice. And that we're starting to have a greater impact, we think, on the, on the neighboring communities, on the regional communities. So Nano Career Day, uh, I could have just put that up and said, oh, you get a career in nanotechnology. But I started thinking, you know, when you think about nano careers, that, that is just not an easy question anymore about what type of job you want to have. You can say, I want to have a job in nanotechnology, but that's really too vague. And I'm going to show you why. And hopefully, uh, by the time that you leave here today, you'll have an idea of some jobs in nanotechnology and what those jobs might be. So again, we have about uh, 1,200 students on site. We have about 80 teachers, about 40 um, schools that we work with in Nano Career Day. And we have these constellations, Nano Science, Nano Engineering, Nano Bioscience, and Nano Economics at CNSE. And you heard from Michael Fancher this morning on Nano Bioscience, uh, Nano Engineering, 
how you build devices, nano, nanoscience, what is the uh, theory behind what you're doing. And again, what we're trying to think about is how do you address grand challenges in society. Uh, it's no longer what we're doing on a small scale, it's what can we do that will impact the greatest number of individuals. And that is an economic impact, and it's a, it's a societal impact, and uh, it's the first step, I think, in viewing nanotechnology. Nanotechnology will really, I think, uh, have an international impact uh, in this regard. So, if you want a nano career job, uh, what is what is that? So the next three slides really talk uh, to that point about what a nano career job is. So. If you want to get a job, for example, in the semiconductor industry, what about nanomedicine and health? Uh, maybe you're a doctor. We now have an MD, uh, a nano MD program, a PhD MD program that is the first of its type in the nation. And what we realized is it would help if doctors would understand a little bit about MEMS and MEMS devices, and especially what we call bio MEMS, the bio MEMS devices that are going to be lab on a chip. So. If you think about our medical industry, we're constantly being told that our medical industry might go bankrupt, right? It's, it's having serious financial issues. So how do we solve that? We solve that through point of care. So we've already been told that we have phones that we carry around and now integrated into our lives. If we forget our phones, we turn the car around, we go back, because that's got everything on it that we want to do for the day, so we're not going to leave them behind. So you can put different scanners on these, but what about the types of scanners that might fit under your watch? What about something that you know you might even wear in jewelry? What about a, a sensor that might be built into your clothes? So we're going to have point of care devices, and these can be very simple devices. Now, sometimes they're called a lab on a chip or an organ on a chip. Now, they don't have to be a complete organ, but if you wanted to, let's say, um, monitor uh, particles in the air and how they were going through, let's say, an alveolar or an endothelial layer in your in your lungs, well, let's put an alveolar layer and an endothelial layer and let's put it on a little chip and let's use that as a sensor. And so you can have these devices that mimic some of the complex components of organs without necessarily having to start with the heavy complexity of building an organ. And so that is really going to revolutionize, revolutionize our healthcare care uh, nano manufacturing, again, bottom up assembly as well as top down assembly. This will bring in biology into man made devices. Sustainability, uh, always the environmental uh, environmental impact and how we can uh, better use our resources and reuse our resources. And then, even thinking if you're in the field, do I want to be on the business side or do I want to be on the technical side? Because there will still be business roles and there will still be technical engineering roles. So, it turns out that. I was just at the, I was at the Neotech conference recently this year, and then I was at the Fulton Montgomery Community College, speaking to a group of uh, teachers for uh, these two-year colleges. And we had a speaker there, uh, Craig Wolf from Global Boundaries, and he was talking about wake up bad jobs and really what they need. So let me tell you a little bit about what they might need at Global Boundaries if you wanted to get a job. And what he was talking about was STEM education, yes, but why? because you need to know how to analyze, you need to know how to diagnose, you need to know how to problem solve. And we always talk about this word hypothesis-driven research. So it's not the idea that you say, well, what if I drew this pumpkin off the roof? What's gonna happen? Your hypothesis would be, as I predict, if I would grow this pumpkin off the roof, it's going to make a big splat, and then I'll be able to use that to predict maybe some um, elements of how strong an outer surface has to be related to gravity and forces. So you have a, a, a deeper reason for doing things, a deeper reason for asking your questions. So that's what they want, is they want you to be able to troubleshoot. Things don't always work out. What do you do if you're in your car and it breaks down on the side of the freeway, right? You have learned how to troubleshoot, whether it's calling, you know, calling a roadside service, or whether it's you, you have the tools in your truck and you get out and repair that tire. So you need to know how to analyze that. That's because there is a life cycle of materials. There are um, the, the in route, which is what are the standards to produce that material, what's the product design, what are the tools, what are the utilities that are used to run those tools. Uh, you were showing air conditioners on the roof to really cool these electronic systems. Uh, what are the materials that we need, metrology, measurements, microscopy, any of that. 
what comes out, software, circuit boards, consumer products, equipment. So you have to think about it on those levels. Now this is a document that you can go get from natech.org, right here at the bottom. And it's this beautiful document put together by, the point is not really working, but it's put together by all these groups, Intel, Texas Instruments. What do all these groups have in common? When you think about making a computer chip, what drove all these companies to work together? Well, they're all involved in one of the processes to make a computer chip. It's not that one company makes a chip, Somebody makes the silicon. Somebody makes the next material you're going to lay on top. Somebody makes the tools to ride that out. Somebody makes the chemicals to clean out what you just uh, dug out of the chip. Somebody makes the tools to develop the mass. Somebody makes the tools to create the wavelength, and you're going to shine through that mass. So everybody is involved, and so everybody is committed to really uh, making this work. And then you also, again, have National Science Foundation in here. So if you look in here, there's operating the equipment, processing the wa wafers. Here's electri electrical electronic systems. We need people trained in electrical electronic systems. Pneumatic systems, hydraulic systems, mechanical electromechanical systems, vacuum system systems. These areas in here are seen as being pretty fundamental. Then look down here, you have to be interpersonal. Interpersonal is just as important because you're going to be working with this large team of individuals, so you have to be interpersonal. You have to be dynamic and be able uh, to maybe communicate uh, across boundaries and, uh, and across uh, your level of understanding to different types of groups. So I thought this would be helpful because if you want a job at Global Boundaries, then this starts to, to tell you where you need to have the skills and training. So I think when you're teaching in schools, that's what you need to do. You need to say, well, these are the type of jobs. They'll be business jobs, they'll be engineering jobs, they'll be different type of engineering jobs. There'll be a technical engineer that might come in at one level. There'll be a higher level engineer that might require a PhD or a master's. And there will be that level, and then there will be the whole business side that we have to handle. You know, how do we get the materials in? How do we get the materials out? How do we communicate um, with, with industry for these products? So I think that this is helpful to see these types of materials that you don't always see. All right, so on the medicine side, uh, the problem with jobs is in nanotechnology is they don't just relate to the semiconductor industry. Um, biology and medicine, being a tra trained not just as a biologist, but a biologist who understands engineering. Being trained not just as an engineer, but an engineer who understands biology. And you really need this cross-disciplinary training. So it's important to train in STEM, but not if you just train as an engineer, not if you just train as a mathematician, not if you're just trained as a biologist, you really need to integrate them across fields and get a little bit of training in all areas. And you can see here at CNSC, we have these, uh, CNSC works both with federal and state government. Uh, this is infrastructure that you heard about today, this high value workforce that we need to, to really keep everything going. Community colleges are very, very important to work with community colleges and each of the colleges is starting to have their own on-site facilities. They're starting to participate in more outreach programs. Uh, and this is this is a great step for the STEM training. And then also the skill skill set of just trained technicians. And I showed you some of the skills that these technicians may have. And then students. And in terms of nano health and safety and an MD PhD, uh, you can work in the field of nanomedicine and just have a PhD as long as you understand the engineering and biology side and the medical. An MD PhD will better be able to bridge those fields. Uh, for any of us who are either academics, I'm an army brat as well, uh, we know that there are different um, aspects of society that we can get involved in, which sometimes seem to separate us out. Uh, with an MD, you have access really to the patients, you have better access to uh, tissue samples, you understand how the medical industry works, you understand maybe where the needs of the medical industry are. So an MD PhD will hopefully be better able to recognize those challenges and work with engineers and work with biologists and engineers on these problems. This, for example, here might be a little sensor chip that you would wear. Uh, you know, we saw it in, in the past, I think, with like caffeine patches, but you might have this little sensor that you would wear and maybe it would detect if you have high blood pressure and maybe it would administer uh, a low dose of med medication. So one of the things that uh, nanomedicine could do for us is uh, give us constant type of treatment and also treat us at an earlier stage so that we're not treating later chronic diseases. 
all right, engineering a stem cell niche. So one of my, uh, some of my training is in working with stem cells, specifically pluripotent stem cells or human embryonic stem cells. Now stem cells are really uh, a special type of tissue uh, derived from early embryos, and these are embryos at stage five. Uh, so these are embryos that are left over from a vitro fertilization and tissue that would be destroyed. That's the only only time we have access to it. If it's going to be destroyed as biological waste, we say let us have those cells, and we'll work with them to understand human disease and understand tissue engineering, and to be able to uh, work them into cell-based therapies where we can increase or improve the quality of human life. And so those are our goals. But these cells are so powerful, they want to go in a million different directions at once. So once you take them out of their controlled environment, which is called a niche, then the material surfaces that you work with, these nanosurfaces, are very important. And so we call it engineering the stem cell niche, and we say that it is a holy grail because we cannot um, fully uh, control differentiation of these cells. We can isolate out the population that we need that has gone down a cell lineage to a specific type of cell, let's say a neural cell or a bone cell or a blood lineage cell, hematopoietic, but we can't get all the cells to go that direction. And as well, how do these cells interact with each other? So one of the beauties that stem cell engineering is doing is it's helping us understand really for the first time human development at a scale that we've never understood it, because think about that. We all came from one fertilized egg, and now look at us. We have at least 250 cell types in our body. We have this wonderful intricate system we can stress to extremes, right? And then and it works together and functions. And that's something that we don't really understand. If we understand that, then we can make true biological genes. So what we do is we take cells in this diagram, we integrate them with surface materials. We have to think about things like tension. Glass and plastic have a different tension, and cells like some, don't like some. And it actually affects the little pathway of genes that are turned on. And so you cannot do this type of stem cells and tissue engineering, the integration with devices, lab on chip, point of care. You couldn't do any of this if you didn't understand biology at, the, at an intricate level. But you also need the engineering side. And so you have to, uh, you can't, we used to be, I think as scientists, we used to be trained in one specific area. And then it was a couple specific areas. And then it was like, okay, how many different areas can I actually be an expert in? And the truth is you can't be an expert in every area, but you can be well informed in many areas. And that allows you to communicate across disciplines and be able to uh, work towards tough questions such as this. All right, and then self-assembling devices. How can we take biological components, let's say here's a mycotic spindle, either chromosomes in the middle. This is going to lead to a new cell here and a new cell there. This machine, has lots of little machines in it. It has this uh, multi-protein complex for growing these tubes, which are microtubules, which they're called microtubules, but they're like 25 nanometers of the nanotubes. We have little motors in there. These motors can generate the force of a supersonic engine. So pretty powerful. They look sort of, uh, when you see little movies of them, they're kind of walking along and they look kind of delicate, but they're pretty, pretty forceful. We can make very small features using EV photography. And so we can model, we need mathematical modelers. We would like to, there is a huge national effort to create uh, modeling databases that are multi-scale. So you can have a virtual organ, a virtual human. So you can plug in all this information and plug it into a virtual model and then use that to predict the outcome. And then modular structures that are man-made, modular structures for biology and how can we bring these together. This was typical top-down approach. A bottom-up approach means that you pull out all these components, they can self-assemble in cells, can we get them to self-assemble in a man-made device? So this is the bottom-up approach. And it's the new strategy, really, for being able to construct very precise devices, structures, devices, um, functions at a scale that we can't reach right now. This on the right is DNA origami. So the other point is we're learning that, for example, a polymer like DNA, a long chain of, of nucleotides, can not only be used to encode information, but we can actually use the code in DNA and we can make structures. We can make a little box. That little box can have a little lid. We can put things in the lid and we can use it to deliver materials. So now we're not only, um, 
not, not only using biologicals, we're mimicking biologicals, and we're taking those biologicals and applying them to new functions. Again, some of this you need to understand the basic biology, but you also need to understand the engineering to work with it. So the next couple slides uh, will give you an idea of, of, well, how are we reaching out? How are we reaching out to high school students? How are we reaching out to teachers? How are we reaching out to parents? And on the last couple of slides, I'll just say this now, I give you some links. Please go to the, the CNSE outreach page, just type in CNSE outreach, and you will get to all these links. And there are little video clips, there are links to uh, national sites, uh, there's just many tools both for, that both describe events that are ongoing at CNSE throughout the year, but also national events that you can, uh, national sites and information that you can use and then also uh, learning tools that we provided. And so I'd encourage you to go to those sites. So what was mentioned is the Girls Youth Eureka Program. Now what that is, is it takes girls, uh, again, these are girls who are maybe high-risk girls. They uh, are at the, really, at the grade seven through 12, and what we're going to do is we get them for five years. Now we don't get them for the full time for five years, that would be a lot of work. What we do is we will start this summer and we will have a month-long training program for those girls, and they will be seventh graders. And then we will keep interacting with them throughout the school year, and then they're gonna come back as eighth graders, and then they're gonna come back as ninth graders, and then in, in the final years before they graduate, what happens is they're going to do internships, that we're gonna have placed internships with them. So they're going to be learning about nanotechnology, they're gonna be learning about the type of jobs that they can use, they're gonna have hands-on experience, and then they're going to apply it in an internship, and then what we hope is that this will be a very successful program. And it has been for different girls in programs. Now the Eureka program is a very special five-year program, and there aren't many of these in the US, so CNSC is very proud to partner with them to do that. Now we just don't start with 30 years, 30 girls in the first year, because that would maybe not be challenging enough. And so what we do is the second year, we get a second group of 30, the third year, another group so we are going to ramp this up until I believe we have um, three years of 30, so I think we'll get up to almost 100 students that we'll have at one time uh, working on this program. We have Nano Career Day, as I mentioned. Career Day and Nano is complex because there's all these levels that you can get involved in, but you just have to start with what excites you and then move on from that to understand what is the skill set that you need to move into that. But again, analytical diagnostic type of training will, will help you. Nano High, this is a program specifically with an Albany City School District. Uh, so far they've graduated about 80 students in that. It's a uh, curriculum that was developed for these students uh, where they come, they have both in-class modules and then they also come over to CNSE and work with some of the equipment and professors and graduate students at CNSE. So it's a multidisciplinary learning environment and also they get to see uh, different students in different stages of their career, which is helpful. Uh, these nano camps, which are often summer camps, that can be um, from two days to a week to four weeks to six weeks long. Uh, different programs, for example, CSEP, Collegiate Science and Technology Entry Program, uh, again for uh, high risk students as part of New Albany. We have Science, Health, and Discovery Night. So again, we'll go out to some of these schools and we'll bring, bring faculty to talk about uh, what we do and to answer questions. We have, this was another summer program. Uh, Career Cafe, one of the fun things I got invited to do was to go to Morgansville uh, High School. And they had about 20 students that were, I would say juniors and seniors, interested in STEM and interested in careers. And they actually, it wasn't just nanotechnology related, but it was different type of careers related. And it was just to be on a, an approachable one-to-one -one level with those students. Uh, and then multi-year on-site lab research. Uh, where, where we can, we take high school students in our lab. Now, the problem is we can't often take many. Um, we usually take one or two students a year, maybe in each lab, but high schools are starting to learn that if, if they train their students right at the beginning, how do you read a scientific paper, or do you find a scientific paper, and then how do you how do you give a presentation, just give a presentation on that scientific paper, what were the questions that were asked, why did they do it, was it good science, was it bad science, could they have done more, uh, who else is doing that kind of science, and then they start working in the labs, and then they understand it at a better level. So just a lot we can do on how do you access information because if you're if you're trying to solve a difficult problem you have to know how to access information. We all do it anyway if we're trying to find um, our favorite auto 
flower shop or a favorite place to eat, we all go access information. So students just need to be trained on how to do that with, with nanotechnology. These are just some pictures from uh, the summer camp program. Uh, 2010, for example, uh, 45 students, 2009, 36 students. They get to dress up in clean room suits. They get to work on some of the equipment, a lot of the equipment that John showed you. So we yeah, I'm happy that, that he went first. Uh, so it's meant to be very hands-on. And again, since our students in labs are in high school, they're undergrads, they're graduate students, they're postdocs, uh, there's faculty. The faculty love to be in the lab. We love to be in the lab. So they interact with all of us, and they really get the full picture of what it's like, like if you took this type of career. Yeah. OK, just a couple slides. Um, this, I just wanted to put it up to say maybe the type of questions that we ask now about what kind of job we want need to be a little bit more detailed than this. Maybe it needs to be a little bit more than how did you get where you're going or what are you doing. Um, but I think uh, maybe what what grand challenge in society do you want to address? It, I, th I think it has to be a little bit more, uh, more direct. And so we need to rethink how we introduce students to jobs that we may not have had that we might not know about versus jobs that we do know about. Um, there are regional efforts, again, Everything that I won't have time to cover here is on the CNSE outreach site. So you'll see that there are regional efforts. We work with Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, Nanotechnology and Nature at Pinebush, Nano in the Mall. You don't come to us, we'll come to you. So we were at the mall and we had, again, this whole setup of everything made from nanomaterials and how nanomaterials impact our lives, but we don't realize it. Uh, again, educating educators and administrators. Uh, the, sorry, I spelled that wrong. <laughs> the, the City School District Programs Empire State Association of Two-Year College Biologists. Uh, I was just there uh, last week. Mia Tech Project Lead the Way. Teacher resources on the web. If we don't have them, we're going to give you the link to who does have them. So we're going to give you a link to national efforts. So please look there. And then in November, come to come to CNSC in, in November because we have talks and we have tours and we have demonstrations and you'll get excited and Elaine Calieris will speak and he is, he is somebody not to be missed. So uh, come again to our programs. Uh, the OASIS program uh, is for seniors. Uh, so, so we really try and reach out to a variety of different, uh, different groups in the public and, and make it accessible and be accessible to anybody who needs to ask us questions or learn more. And then Nano for Kids, again, I think this is an effort that has to be made. We have some, uh, some, I guess, demonstration objects up here, you know, whether it's putting it on the back of cereal boxes, whether it's doing uh, nanotechnology for grades one through six, whether, you know, whether it's a book that you develop, but we have to do uh, innovative approaches towards nanotechnology and really start reaching these kids because you can see these kids are very young and they are climbing all over these computers, they are climbing all over these devices. They are interested, they're fervent for that knowledge, so we need to give them that knowledge. And work with museums as well. Working with museums uh, is one very fast way to reach a large, uh, a large membership of your community. Or go to museums if, if you're, you're in the public here. So this just shows you one of the links, for example, K-12 and some of the activities that are on here, teacher resources and K-12 resources. Uh, again, many, many, uh, new activities and older activities. There are video clips on here. So lots of interesting resources. So a lot of layer to this. So I, I would definitely go to the CNSE outreach site and you'll find some more information. And <coughs> two last slides I think here. One is really to point out that we are doing great things with undergraduate research. We just had our first uh, Goldwater Scholarship Award here. Um, so, and our Goldwater uh, follow-up award. So we're, this is a nationally recognized uh, competition, so this means that in the nation we're starting to be recognized really in the type of education that our students are getting in <coughs> nanotechnology. <coughs> Again, comprehensive, so I won't go over that. Art. You can, you don't have to tell these kids, I know you love fine arts, but put that behind, go to nanotechnology, because the government is saying, for example, <coughs> NSF is saying, we want disruptive thinking. There are great artists out there, like fine arts or sculptors or painters, and they have great ideas, and they have a disruptive way of looking at tough questions, and they can help inspire you, and they can help you think outside the box. 
so on one grant we actually had Professor Ed Meyer, who stalls, uh, be on part of our grants, and it was an emerging frontiers in research and innovation. So you don't have to say that just because you're in STEM, you can't be an artist, uh, you can't be in fine arts, you can't be in music. Uh, there are lots of applications where the two fields cross. Again, just this is what our website looks like, the nano government where you can get more information, all of this outreach here, all of this, go to this site because there's too much information for me to really be able to cover it today. Our combined programs, high school, doctoral programs, workforces, bachelor's degree, undergraduate degrees, technician level, PhD, um, MS degrees, so really covering all aspects. And I think the last one is this, which is interesting, because Mike, Mike Mantra and I did not coordinate, but we're both ending up with the same slide. So, um, so great minds or similar minds think alike. The SUNY campus is diverse. It's technology colleges, it's community colleges, and these are all very, very different is what you'll find out. Uh, the university colleges, these are all under one umbrella, which maybe, I don't know, maybe that's a little bit unfair to, to some of the smaller schools. We have to think about this as a statewide effort, as a, a regional effort as a national effort and really uh, work together and so it's one of the reasons I'm very excited to be here uh, because Albany working with, I know we're out here, um, Albany working with uh, Utica Rome, working with SUNY IT and I'm going to stop there so we have time for questions because I think questions are very important and having the opportunity to, to come look at some of these books and speak.